Nigel Short commented on this game in the his column at the time in the Telegraph, I think it was, and he called it a minor a minor master, masterpiece, showing a complete grasp of Nimzovician principles, which I was very touched by. And it, it, it is a Nimzovic game in some ways. It could be in a, a new version of my system. Um, that's why I was proud of it. That's why it's the one I want to share. The following is a conversation with Jonathan Rawson. I am privileged to be doing this interview or a podcast, you can say, because when I was young, when I was around 17 or 18 years old, I read his books. I read his book called The Chess for Zebras. And it kind of changed my understanding about chess. He brought spirituality to chess. He brought about so many elements together. And it's after several, several years that I've been able to get in touch with him and do this interview. Uh, It was fantastic. We speak about chess, spirituality, how the two come together. We talk about his favorite game, uh, where chess is going what he thinks about chess improvement and so much more Uh, it is something that you will really enjoy watching and also jonathan is currently in india and on 16th he is in calicut doing a workshop as well as a simul the link of which i have actually attached in the description of this video so you can check it out and now let's go to the conversation uh, Jonathan, it's an absolute honor to have you here. I'll tell you why uh, I'm very excited for today speaking to you and also just getting to know you better. When I was a very young boy, uh, I read this and uh-huh. um, this is from your book. Uh, this is the se- uh, Chess for Zebras, uh, the book that you had written. And it talks about chess and Taoism. And it also talks about your concept of doing and being and Mm -hmm. in chess. Mm -hmm. And ever since I read this, I kind of uh, have been a big fan of some kind of the spiritual side or you can say the side of chess, which is deeper. And I think you were the first one who, who opened doors to that. So it's an absolute honor to, you know, talk about it. That's touching to hear, Sagar. And um, yeah, I just, um, I I ended up writing a couple of books when I was younger. The first was The Seven Deadly Chess Sins and the second, Chess for Zebras. And really, I I got carried away in both of them, just following my own interests. Um, And because I was already quite a good player, I think in in the case of Sins, I was um, just recently a grandmaster when I wrote it. Um, With Zebras, I was more about my own journey from about 25 to 2600 so it was a bit richer and a bit sort of more serious but the but both of them in their own way is about the human experience of playing chess and the the human struggle to get better at it um which as you know and as every chess player knows is a kind of journey it's an odyssey it's uh you feel your whole meaning of life is about your rating and whether or not you win that next game and which openings you're playing and um that that inner game, that kind of uh, making sense of who you are through chess and finding meaning in life through chess, I just felt it wasn't written enough about. Um, sorry, written about enough. Um, and the, the heat here in India is getting to me. Um, and uh, the Taoist connection is particularly interesting because when I was teach, it's not as though I'm particularly a Taoist. As you know, I bring in a lot of a lot of different perspectives to bear. But I thought it was relevant because so many mistakes in chess, even at quite a high level, um, are caused by excessive effort. You know, they're caused by striving to make something happen on the board. This is particularly relevant when people have a fairly clear positional advantage. I'd often see people who maybe suddenly got a better structure and they have more scope for their pieces and uh the the, the 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 position is inherently going to become better and better if they keep playing good moves. But they would often like lash out and try and like make an attack happen or they'd focus all of their energies on one perceived weak pawn and lose the positional advantage. Whereas if instead they sort of saw that their duty here was not to actually enact something and make the change, but rather sort of manage the change that's already underway, 
then uh, they'd have better results. And a lot of people have commented on that chapter in particular on doing and being, because, because I think there's something about chess literature and chess teaching that puts the pressure on you mm. as a player to make everything happen. Right. But it's not just about you, your opponent's there, right? Um, and they're full of their own neurosis and confusion and doubts and mistakes and memories. And the position has its own objective kind of reality. And so your job is to kind of meet, to manage this whole thing, your own psyche, your opponent's psyche, what's happening actually on the board. And the skill in chess is about a kind of nimbly moving between these things. Whereas bad chess is about, oh my God, it's all about me. I've got to, I've got to sort this out, you know? And it's like, no, you, you've got to just don't screw up your position help it along, but it has a life of its own, you know, like allow it to be what it has to be. Um, and then remember your opponents there and they'll take, they'll take some share of the responsibility for what happens next. Yeah, true. I mean, isn't that like, uh, very similar to life, for example, since many years, for example, whenever something needed to be done, I always used to think that everything is in my control. Yeah. And well, while it is true, it used to put a lot of pressure on me. But yeah. then when I started to feel like, yes, I need to do my stuff, but just then let, because there's so many forces at action. Yeah. There can be someone coming in, something might like happen. And that kind of put the pressure a little bit away. Like I will do my best and then maybe it happens. Maybe yeah. it doesn't. This is. I mean, this is true. And you've got, you, there are times in life where you really have to apply enormous effort. Um, and, and don't, don't get me wrong. I'm, 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 I don't think it's true that you, you simply let things be. There's a, there's a case for studying, for trying hard sometimes, sometimes extreme dedication, sometimes for years, you know, I, I'm not knocking any of these things, but it's also true that there's an illusion of control right. that you think that you're actually, you're the one who's making everything happen. And that's not the case. You're you're caught up in a various circles of influence and um, cause and effect that are beyond your control. Um, where your job is to adapt and adjust to the things that happen, rather than imposing your will on them all the time. You have to find a way for your own will, your own sense of what should happen and what you want to happen, to be in relationship to what is already happening and which which other people want to happen. So that's the kind of dance of life. And it, it applies on the chessboard too. Absolutely. You know, you have all of these depth uh, and you brought it to chess. But in general, how did this come to you? Uh, also, the fact that uh, you are in India right now, has that played any role in your life? Well, India's played a big role in my life. Um, so my wife, Shiva Tambashetti, is, um, well, she's, she grew up in Kerala, mostly in Calicut. But she studied at National Law School in India. And um, so she has various influences from the South. Um, uh, but Calicut's probably closest to her home. And um, I guess I met her in 98. So that's going back like half my lifetime ago. Where, where did um, you meet her? At Oxford. We were both students. Oh, okay. um, and we met in her final year. We actually met, <clears throat> I mentioned some of this in the in the book, The Moves That Matter, that we might come on to. Um, I met her because we both learned to, med <clears throat> to meditate at the same time. Mm. And um, we were doing different courses. We wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise have known each other. But uh, yeah, we learned transcendental meditation. And I haven't been such a diligent follower of it, but it's been part of my life since then. And uh, then we got married a few years later, 2005. So it's actually seven years later. So, um, and then we had, you know, our first son in uh, 2009 and second one a bit later. So yeah, India is a big part of my life through through marriage mostly. And in 2003, is that right? 2003, I think it is. Um, or possibly 2002, no, 2004, sorry, I was in India. Um, and I, I was invited to a tournament in Delhi. Mm. Um, and uh, I played in it, I played okay, nothing special. Um, but I got the experience of chess in India then, but it's so different now, right? Yeah. Um, and at the time, I wrote a piece called Chess Behind the Chapati Curtain for New in Chess. Okay. Um, it was a joke. It's basically, you know, they speak about chess behind the Iron Curtain in the Soviet years. And they also spoke about chess behind the, uh, let's see, Tortilla Curtain for, for the kind of 
Mexico especially. I, I read that somewhere. So I thought, let's do chess behind the chapati curtain as a joke, entirely a joke. Um, and uh, it, it was a genuine reflection of my experience of culture shock in India the first time I came. Because I think what a lot of people outside of India don't appreciate is it, it depends a lot on where you land. India is a big country and it, it varies a lot. Mm -hmm. It also depends how much support you have and people can protect you from things and so on. But when I came to Delhi, I came alone um, and I came in the night and I was staying in a hotel that maybe wasn't the very best hotel. And I um, I just saw things on the streets that I couldn't really process, you know, so it's a bit of a cliche, but even things like monkeys and cows and uh, a family of five on one motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's exciting and kind of amazing. But after exposure, sudden exposure to this, your perceptual apparatus doesn't really know what to do with it. It's like, and then of course, at the time, I don't see this so much in Kerala, but in Delhi, um, you know, people with disabilities begging and and the, the sort of and the traffic and just all of the sights and signs of the place um was too much and of course it's not entirely a negative story there's also the richness and the abundance and the color and the sound and you know india is just this massive it's a carnival of uh the lights but it's also the sort of assault on the senses when you first get there and after a little while you get used to it and it's like okay i'm in a different country different things happen in a different way here and you begin to get into the groove of, and the tune of the place. Uh, but I do remember that feeling of culture shock because that term is used, but it has a real physiological basis. You know, you feel it in your body when you can't actually make sense of what's happening around you. And that's what happened the first time. And I think that was reflected a bit in the piece I wrote because I, was, I wasn't I was unkind. I was very grateful to the people who had invited me and uh, I, I was enriched by the experience. I went to the Taj Mahal one day, for example, and uh, there was a lot of support and people were very friendly and all the rest of it. But still, I regret somewhat that my tone was a little bit unkind, let's say. It was a little bit um, focusing on the negative. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That's 20 years ago now. Yeah. But um, yeah. I've learned to know India much better since then. Um, mostly the South. Uh, since then, it's been Bangalore, um, some Kerala, some, some Tamil Nadu, um, been to the sort of highlands of the Tamil Nadu area and um, Mahabalipuram happened. I've been to Chennai, um, a little bit less time in Karnataka, but but Bangalore, obviously. Uh, and then my family, because they're Telugu speakers, I, I haven't been to Andhra Pradesh, but I sort of feel it at some level through the language. Um, and then Kerala is, I think, the place I feel most at home in India. I, mm -hmm. I find it an yeah. utterly fascinating place. <laughs> Yesterday, I was in an auto. And uh, I could see from my just my line of sight, first of all, a, a communist flag, first of all, a kind of old, a little bit like the old Soviet one. But then behind that, a uh, cross, the Christian church, and then behind that, a mosque. And these are these influences are all there in Kerala. It's still a 50 percent odd Hindu um, place. But the fact that these influ influences are happening at once just makes it so incredibly rich and fascinating culturally. Um yeah, so India is a big part of my, and then that, that all of that's personal stuff about my own experience. What you were originally asking, I think, was more the kind of spiritual side. Mm. And there, I suppose, well, because it's... I because I also uh, got to know that you are like the director of Social Brain Center, and uh, you know th these are some of the initiatives where, we, and then you write about things. I follow you on Twitter; they are always very deep. So, so I don't know from where that that came into you. You do research on well, things. The, the, if you if you don't mind, Sagar, I, I forgot to bring it with me, but I'll take a copy of my book just to show because uh, it's all described in there. Can you just pause it for one you, second? You mean this one? Yes. Uh... Maybe you have it. Ah, you have it. Great. I don't need to do that. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, yes, this book explains everything where it all sort of came from. I mean, look, I don't want to set myself up as some kind of sage because I struggle to get through the day like everybody else mm -hmm. and make all sorts of mistakes and things I regret like everybody else. But insofar as I have an interest in matters of the fundamental nature, meaning and purpose of life, I describe in that book, you know, why that became a kind of focus and how chess helped me to navigate that. Wow. Um, so the, the sort of quick answer of this is that when I was uh, six, I became a type one diabetic. Um, that's one influence. What that did for me is 
from a very young age, you have to attend to yourself more closely than you might otherwise. Mm. Because if your blood sugar drops too low or it goes particularly high, you're actually in medical danger. And, and so you learn, even as a very young child, to kind of introspect and think, what's going on here? And I think I carried some of that with me as I grew up. Um, another influence was, and this is all detailed in the book, my parents separating um, when I was quite young, having to spend quite a lot of time alone. Um, and then as I was trying to make sense of my family life kind of falling apart, I, I, I had to sort of navigate in some way. And chess arrived in my life just the right time mm. because suddenly there was this world I could control or with enough resistance from the opponent to make it a real challenge to control it. But still a world where if I studied and tried and played, I actually could feel competent in this world and, and relatively safe in my own way. Um, and a few days ago, by the way, I was watching The Queen's Gambit, the Netflix series. And Beth Harmon character says yes. something very much like this. She Definitely. says something very similar. And it, um, my book actually came out just before The Queen's Gambit, a few months back before it. Um, but but it, although well, my book is less glamorous and you know you don't have the same extraordinary visual effects, um, it, there is some parallels in the in the, the struggle to sort of forge a an identity and uh, a coherent sense of self when your world is collapsing around you and, mm -hmm. and chess can help you with that. Right. And that's part of it. And then the final thing I'd add, I suppose, is that I did end up studying philosophy at university. I mean, I, um, I did something called PPE at Oxford, which is politics, philosophy, and economics. So my sort of intellectual foundation was an interest in fundamental questions about who we are, how we should manage our collective life, what's worth living for. These were things that I was studying and thinking about. Um, and then I developed that in my master's degree and PhD later. Um, but it, to be honest, it's always been a kind of fun, you know, just, I just go with the things that are most interesting and uh, chess was one of those things, but I, I always felt chess was a kind of plan B, mm. um, even though I didn't really have a plan A, you know, <laughs> not, I didn't really have, I always thought chess was there. I'll come, I'll keep doing this until something else sorts itself out. And you mentioned the social brain center, uh, Sagar, that's true. That was a few years back now. So I, what happened was I was playing chess, I was studying, I was playing chess, I was studying, not really knowing what I was doing. And lots of people are like this. Yeah. And then around about 2008, um, I think I was peaking. I probably could have got even better, but I was peaking around 2600. I spent some time working with Anand. I, I can, we can come back to that. Um, I, I, I was running a bit out of steam with chess, though. I was beginning to wonder what exactly am I trying to do here? even if my rating goes up a bit more, even if I win some more tournaments, it's the game ceased to feel essential mm. to keep myself together. I felt I could live without it for the first time in my life. Mm. Um, and uh, I was also becoming a father for the first time. And around then, uh, my we saw this job opening up in London where we were then living. And it looked like I was, for the first time, a job that maybe I could do... Um, so, you know, with good old job applications, you have to make yourself fit the role. And I did that. And this was at a place called the Royal Society of Arts in London. And I remember staying up late that night to do the application and Shiva, and my wife, helped me. Um, and then a few days later, I had an interview. And before I know it, I had a proper job. So I went from being this chess playing, you know, student, free life, traveling around the world and all the rest of it, to being in an office with uh, Microsoft Outlook meetings, pump, jumping into my inbox saying, okay, you've got a meeting at 11 about the, you know, I don't know, whatever it was about the budget or whatever. Um, and, um, but it was a great place because I quickly realized that if I could raise funds, if I could bring in the money, I could pretty much do what I wanted. And so I, I learned the skill of pitching ideas to funders mm so that they felt you were helping them achieve their objectives. And that might require a kind of intellectual entrepreneurship. So I started doing work on climate change, and I even did some work on spirituality. So at the RSA, I did a two-year project. And if anyone's interested, there's a, a book that's freely available online called Spiritualize. And the second edition of that is the most recent one. Um, and that was really just my sense that people were needlessly stopping themselves in their conversations. They were like, um, they wouldn't go all the way with the, the the meaning and purpose of life. They would hold back at some point and say, that's for the private realm. You do whatever you like there. And I was always like, if you want to deal with these big problems in the world, 
you've got to take in all the resources you can, including the ultimate question of what we're trying to do together. Um, and that was a simple thought, but a fairly radical one for the context I was in. Um, and that, alongside the work on climate change, meant that I had sort of developed a persona of big collective action problems with the inner life at their center. And um, that led me to, I, I got, I got, I developed a friendship and um, professional relationship with a man called Thomas Bjorkman, who gave me enough funding to leave the RSA and set up my own institute. Mm -hmm. And that's called, that's called Perspectiva. That was back in 2015, 16 now. Um, but that meant that since then, I've been the director of that institute. And our work is all about this kind of, our tagline is systems, souls, and society. So systems are like economy, democracy, ecology, all that kind of stuff. Uh, souls is the inner life, and society is our kind of shared life and how we do it together. Um, so that's my life now. That's the, that's the job I do. Uh, the team is growing. We're, we're doing quite well. Um, chess is becoming part of it again. Mm. I've started playing a little bit. Okay. Uh, anyway, that's a lot for you to chew on. Uh, you, you're getting back to chess now, yeah? Like you're playing, well, you're also teaching, I guess. A little. Let's put it this way. There's a kind of cycle of time happens. So mm. something like I mentioned, 2008, I... I remember playing the Olympiad in uh, Dresden in Germany, and I was playing pretty well, um, although some disappointing games as well. But I remember the feeling of, I actually played Magnus in that tournament when he was quite young. Uh, he was maybe 17 or 18. Um, and I remember thinking, if I kept playing, I could maybe get somewhere deeper into the 2600s, but I probably couldn't get as far as 27. I just wasn't. Mm. wasn't competent enough wasn't talented enough the roots weren't deep enough um but i could go further and then i thought i thought of the effort that would take and i also didn't feel i had the appetite felt like i'd run that course um, and so between about 2008 and about now there's been a there's been very little chess there was once or twice i was invited to play in london yeah uh, occasionally a student would show up that i was interested in I might write a little bit about it. I wrote the book that you mentioned, The Moves That Matter. But somehow um, it, it was a sort of slow goodbye to chess. Mm. Then about a year ago, I was invited to play a tournament in London, just as a GM who happened to live in London. Um, and I thought, you know, this is only going to last four or five days. And I haven't played chess for a while. And what have I got to lose, really? Um, so points. I just thought... Well, that's right. And I did. <laughs> I think I lost 20 rating points, actually. Um, exactly. But here's the thing about rating points, right? There's the vanity question. Now, as you know, rating is your status in the chess world. It's how people quickly gauge how important you are. Um, but look at life from the fuller perspective, really. You're, we're all going to die pretty soon. We're right. all going to spend time doing what we're good at, what we love, what, what is actually a contribution to others in some way. And I just suddenly thought that the time was right not to try and climb the climb the heights again you know i think those days are gone i don't i don't have any expectations of going back beyond 2600 or you know um and even today that doesn't even mean very much right, right. like you have to get to like 2750 before you're really making any changes so um i it's more for the love of the game but but to really love the game i think you also have to um take it a little bit seriously i don't think you can really appreciate the game if there isn't some real intent to play well, if it's only casual, oh, I'm just doing it for the fun, you won't really get the fun. You know, this is the paradox. It's like right. you, you, you've you got to sort of take it seriously to actually get the pleasure out of it. Correct. Now, I don't really I don't really have time to study openings in great depth anymore. But that's a new challenge. It's like, how do I spend an hour on something I would previously have spent 20 hours on? Right. Uh, you know, that's the challenge. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, but I just... My, to to talk about this when you were at the sort of highest strength of yours that as you mentioned around 2600 and you had this uh, a lot of awareness about your inner being as you said uh, you used to think deeply about things and i think a lot of your uh, sort of books show that that whatever are what comes from within you 
actually come often shows up on the board right yeah. Uh, yeah. what do you think was stopping you from making because you were so aware you were so conscious why were you not able to maybe reach 2700 right. beyond uh, that and so on so i think um appetite is the quick quick answer appetite so by that i mean as i say in 2008 um before dresden olympiad i spent time in this camp with vishi and the same camp was Kazimierzanov and Peter Heinenil. And this was preparing for the Kramnik match. And I was there partly because I was on friendly terms with Vichy and we um, just just knew each other and, and liked each other. And I, I proposed I might be able to help him with the match. Um, but also uh, maybe a little bit because he was starting to play D4 and I was a D4 player and I thought I might be able to help. Um that was a very interesting experience because you get to see the gap, right? So I already knew Vichy was better than me, don't get me wrong. But I, I, the, the extent of that, mm -hmm. not just in caliber of judgment on the board and speed of calculation and practical judgment about decisions, the depth of preparation, of course, is there, the knowledge of end games, like, you know, everything, just the, the caliber of, of the player was just so much better way beyond anything I could ever hope to achieve. But even, you know, even if I did have the desire, there were limits. That was part of the point. But the deeper point was I actually could feel myself inside no longer caring quite so much. Um, in other words, it felt like my, that what life was asking of me was not to keep on conquering in the chess world, to try and grow as a player I felt like actually I was better served elsewhere. I was, I had more to offer outside of the chess world than inside it. I didn't want to abandon it. I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't rejecting it. It's just like it had formed me. I was grateful to it. I'd come back to it. I still had friends there, but it wasn't any longer where the center of life was. Um, and I, and given that I felt that that's a fatal thing to feel at that level, right? right. You can't play at that level, even at 2,600, unless you're really dedicated. Um, and I think you can see that actually in some of my games at the time. I remember at that, that Olympiad, I lost games to uh, Nidic from Germany. I think I lost to um, uh, Jobava from Georgia, um, the game against Magnus. And all of these games, you can sort of see me running out of steam at some point. Like the game goes kind of well. I'm playing on equal terms with them up to a certain point. And then uh, something just kind of collapses. And it's it was to do with maintaining that intensity of purpose. Um, yeah, so it was just a recognition inside that this was a life was calling for something else for me. Um, Are you happy with uh, the switch that you have made in general? I, I am, I am, I really am. To be honest, I'm proud of many things in chess, but I'm most proud of being able to say good, uh, sort of fond goodbye to it mm -hmm. when I had to. Uh, and also happy to be coming back to it to a limited extent now. Um, I can't say though I don't regret it. You know, this is I mentioned this in the book somewhere. Um, it's neither there's the reader will have, the viewer will have to pay close attention to this because what I'm about to say is a bit subtle, right? Because mm -hmm. people think either you regret it or you don't, mm -hmm. right? That's the, the typical way people think about it. You could have played so many more great games. You could have been a higher rated player. You might have, you know, I don't know, your country needed you to be even better, whatever. Um, or you're so relieved that you got over it. You didn't get trapped inside the chess world forever. The truth is somewhere in between. It's that I'm absolutely certain I made the right decision. And I regret it every day. Right? This is this is closer to the heart of the matter. Because, listen, what chess gives you, people don't realize this, the delicious taste of concentration for hours on end, there are few things in life better than being able to concentrate. And chess gives it to you in abundance. People don't realize this, but in addition to all the beautiful geometry and tactics and openings and all the excitement of the game, above all else, it's giving you many hours at a time of delicious concentration. And few things in life give you that now, especially in the world of smartphones and adverts and all the other distractions. Right. Concentration is divine, and chess gives it to you, basically. I, I kind of feel that this is a new concept that I'm learning today. It's like positive regret. 
Uh, that you have yeah like <laughs> generally i see negative regret everywhere but here you are like okay i regret it but i'm happy about it you know it, it's it's a fuller truth i think um and um i actually call it in an article it's also in the book uh the moves that matter i call it successful underachievement mm. successful underachievement it's a weird term because people always assume that you know for example i, I don't know maybe i Maybe I actualized about 95% of my potential or even 98% of it or whatever. And there's a kind of go get him self-help mentality that says you should have gone all the way, you know, you should have kept going. But actually that comes at a great cost. You know, you have one life, you have 80 years, give or take, um, and you have many wonderful things to experience beyond uh, the Sicilian Nidorf and the Grunfeld and whatever else, right? So you've got to realize that achieving your goals in life, while it's important that you try, um, there is a wisdom in knowing when to stop um, because there are other things to experience and to get good at and to contribute to. Um, so it doesn't mean, though, that when you do that, you don't wish, oh, my God, I could be, you know, I see a tournament like that and the Reykjavik Open just happened. And I played the Reykjavik Open many years ago, and it was wonderful, you know. So well organized, such a beautiful place, such a distinctive place, great atmosphere. And yeah, there's a part of me that would, you know, I've got a lot of family responsibilities here. I have work calls I'm taking while I'm in Kerala even. Um, and a part of me would love to be by myself playing chess in Reykjavik, right? <laughs> and of course I would, like it'd be fun and, you know, what's not to like, but it's not my life anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not what I'm meant to be doing. So you, you sort of have to find that, listen closely to your life about when you're meant to push and when you're meant to step aside and, and move on, I think both are equally important. Brilliant. Okay, I have uh, more questions around this, but I also want to uh, have a look at one of your games because I think uh, that would be very interesting. And I asked you before uh, this interview that uh, which one is kind of a game that you would love to go over uh, here. And you mentioned this victory over Jonathan Parker, which was actually surprising for me because when I went through your database, you have played against all sorts of great players. You have beaten many players who are, who are around 2,700 and so on. Why did you choose this one? Well, I think it's aesthetically um, it has its charms, partly. Sort of, It's got its own beauty. And it's also because of the competitive context. This was the this was the third year in a row I'd won the British Championship, uh, and it was the last round, and I had to win to win the tournament. Um, but also because I I'd had to I'd, I'd messed up the first part of the event, and I had to then I I think I drew in round seven, so I actually had to score four out of four to win the tournament. And this was the fourth of those games. There was this feeling of momentum of of growing in strength and confidence. And you can sort of feel it in the way I played, the way I, with Black as well, against a good player. Jonathan Parker is a kind of amateur grandmaster, but he was very strong as a young player. And anyone who's played him knows um, if he'd gone professional, he would have been significantly higher rated. And I'd also known him since childhood and we'd played many times before. So psychologically, there was a lot going on. Um, and I was just very proud of the way I, I managed to create enough tension but to remain solid so as not to lose and then there was a couple of finesses in the game. I suppose I saw it as a kind of model Nimzo Indian. Okay. Let's um, so, yeah, let's have a quick look. So, you're black and you went for the Nimzo. Uh, and a kind of a nice... Uh, Nimzo is a nice opening because there's so many imbalances with pawn structures, minor pieces. I think it, it kind of yeah. suits your style. Uh, yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. Although, of course, people go knight f3 and move 3 rather a lot. Mm. That's yeah. a letter. Or G3. Although the book that you have written is on the Grunfeld. Uh, yeah. I mean, that was my first book, but that was published in, I think, 98 or 90, yeah, 98, I think, 99 maybe. Um, and that's 25 years, give or take. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did love the Grunfeld. It was my first love, if you say. And I still play it in Blitz now and again. Um, but the theoretical load is so, so great now mm. that to play at a grandmaster level is very difficult. Yeah, it's one so of knight, the yeah, most yeah. Uh, direct openings. Okay, so knight bd7, f3. f3. Yeah, queen e7, right. So already the key to this position is the annoyance of the pin. I mean, basically white structure is, is bad, but he has a lot of uh, space 
um, and he has somewhat better dark squares potentially because of his bishop. So Black's challenge is somehow to place the pawns on dark squares. Mm. But if you do it in too superficial a manner, you give up squares like d5 and f5. Right. And you also have to be careful that white often sacrifices with c4 to c5. Right. So it's a very dynamic, um, positionally complex setup. Uh, and Jonathan knows it quite well. So um, the next few moves are, you have to be very careful. So you went so g5. As, as you said, you're putting all your pawns on dark squares now. Yeah, or trying to. Um, c5. And then... Um, Queen a4, right? So this is a critical moment. Um, there's a lot going on here. So already white may or may not be threatening e5, but mostly he's trying to stop me casting queenside. Mm, right. um, and he's also asking me, what else are you going to do, right? Because um, I, in order to make some sort of progress, black has to maybe go knight h5 and f5. But white uh -huh. will have eight. White has H. thinking more e5 no here is that well not... yeah you got to be careful though if you go e5 white does not have to go d5 mm. and this is often a mistake now let's imagine for example i go e5 now white probably goes bishop e2 maybe bishop d3 we'll come back to that bishop e2 and then black does something or other but white now has this plan of knight f1 to e3 isn't this like a common idea in so, such, so, okay in let's play it. play a few moves you'll see how black gets in trouble ah. knight f1 king c7 knight e3 you're already in big trouble um, because, yeah, what, there's too much dynamic potential in White's position. The knight comes to f5, h4 happens. He might even go g4 if he has to. The g5 pawn is weak. The queen is on a4 now, but he can also move the queen away and go a4, a5 sometimes. Black's still in the game, don't get me wrong, but White has the initiative. Right. Um, and so somehow you have to be careful about the timing of these things. Um which is why the game, the way the game was played, I think is relevant. Because I played knight h5. I was ready for h4 now. Uh, because if he doesn't go h4, I go f5. And then I'm, I'm developing an initiative. Um, Here came, I think, the most... Maybe your opponent would have been surprised with this Yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. This was the... I'd seen this coming. It's an important move. And and uh, this was exactly the reason why he had put his queen on a4 to stop you from long castling. Uh, yeah. and, and you just gave up the pawn. Give out the pawn because I realize a couple of things. One is that he has to lose a lot of time. Mm. Secondly, the pawn, you've always got to ask in chess, don't give away pawns lightly, right? Because they're the soul of chess, they matter and so on. But some pawns are more important than others, right? So if I gave away my d6 pawn or my g5 pawn or whatever, they would be, you know, my position would be wrecked. But what happens when he takes the a pawn is I keep my structure intact. I gain the a file, I gain a lot of time. And it doesn't actually fundamentally compromise the central structure, which is where all the action is. So, in, in, so this is mentioned in Chess for Zebras, um, uh, to some extent in, in Seven of the Chess Sins, this notion of different, <clears throat> different dimensions of chess. Mm. So material is one dimension, right. but you also have a kind of quality dimension, which has to do with structure and scope and safety and so on. Um, and then you have a kind of time dimension, which is about tempi. And then, of course, you also have clock time, which I call ticking. And the, the game plays out across these dimensions. And chess players are often a bit too materialistic. They think, oh, you're a pawn down now. And not just that, but he's right next to your king. Yes. That's, That's why super... I think this move is the more surprising because the king is also feels like in danger. But once you see yeah. it, you realize, okay, rook a8, now you're getting the initiative on the a5. That's right. And of course, I had to check things like you know e5 here and so on. But, but none of it works. The queen's getting trapped and he, he has to retreat. So I'm gaining time and I'm also, uh, yeah. And so I didn't, didn't need to play rook a8. It's important that actually the queen is in a weird way a bit misplaced on a4 because he, he really wants to go a4, a5. So I didn't play rook a8. I left that for later. The critical move comes next though. After f5, queen c2, g4. Yeah, notice he played queen c2 voluntarily. This is the critical move now, g4. And he's under pressure here because what I'm threatening in some ways is to go g3, yeah. if I can get all these moves, uh, g3, f4, and e5. So just play a few moves for instructional value. Let's say he goes a4. Mm -hmm. I probably go rook a8, actually, just to stop a5. It's practical. Let's say he goes bishop e2 for now. Now, I have other moves here. Don't get me wrong. I have knight f4 and so on. But let's just say g3, bishop g1, f4, 
I'm not saying these are the right moves. Let's say he plays rook b1 just for argument's sake. And then I go e5. Okay, for example, right. Now, look at his rook and bishop on the king side, right? right. Completely dead. And he'll just go and kind of mob this yeah. pawn, then this pawn. Right. And he, his knight, you've got to, always got to watch out about his counterplay. But where is it coming from? He has to get his knight to b5, maybe, yeah. via b1. So, you know, the game goes on, but strategically he must be lost because his bishop is completely dead, his rook's dead. And slowly but surely I'll win either his h-pawn or his a-pawn or both. And it will take time. You've got to be careful, but it should be winning. Amazing. Uh, anyway, that was what I was up to. And that's why he took on it on g4. But here's the key move of the game. In some ways, even more important than Castle Queenside. I had to see this coming as well. Because if I now recapture, let's say I play fg, mm. the game is still quite unclear. He can even go g3 now, stop the knight coming, and then puts the bishop on e2 probably, maybe g2, but probably e2. And then um, maybe rook g1 and bishop e3 comes. And his knight, he might still go a4, he might go e5. Right. Um, it, it's a tense position then. Um, but that's what he was hoping for. But I'd already seen that I had a way of keeping control of the game instead of this. Mm. So when he took on g4, I played knight hf6. Wow. And this was a kind of elegant way of getting a different kind of structure. I think, so, you, uh, is it like you want to fight for the g4 square for your knight and I don't... How do I describe it? It's, it's where is the juice in the position is one way of describing it. The juice is actually in all the weakened light squares that are there. So g4 and e4. Um, but also I had a feeling that I might force him to block the position in a way that would favor me. Hmm. This way I'm, I'm actually, in a weird way, because I'm ahead in development, although he's got the two bishops, I'm carefully trying to open the position where the superior activity of my pieces will show. I mean, he still hasn't castled. His king's in the center. Mm. Yes, I've lost a pawn, but it's not that relevant. Um, so this is a way of trying to keep open lines for all my pieces and put him under some pressure, really. Uh, and he did what he thought he had to do now and began to block it. Yeah. So key move now, knight takes g4, keeping the tension. So, so just to be clear, like if he tries to do such stuff, you know, try to cling on to his pawn, maybe it's just... I take back. I mean, I can also maybe go knight e4 there, by the way, but let's say uh, I take... Uh, I, I, think I, I think I would probably just take, yeah. And this is already getting very nasty for his king here on e1. I think, uh, I think so. I mean, he, he can maybe go d5. I mean, I'm sure it's not winning, mm. but it certainly looks promising. Um because at the very least, I'm going to have a passed e pawn and pressure on the g file. Right. At the very, at the very least, and um, his king is never really going to be that safe anywhere it goes. Correct. So it's a big pressure. So bishop uh, d3, and then you took here. He went yeah. back, and now yeah, now, I thought, now I thought for a while because mm. this is a, again thing with chess. Every, not every moment is equal. You have to decide when to think, and I realized that the excitement of knight hf6 i wasn't going to crush him immediately there was no breakthrough his position is still quite resilient so there's two bishops so there's the center his problem is his king but i thought his h pawn is weak his g file is weak if i can get f4 and e5 in uh he can no longer get a knight to d5 or f5 and therefore i ought to be winning strategically on the g file and that's kind of what happened yeah you play f4 and then you got e5 so now I'm getting it, right? Yeah. Um, and if you look at his position, it's really bad. And so he's doing everything he can to get active. And my really this game in some ways can be seen as a prophylactic game. Yes. Because most of my moves are about preventing him getting up. Oops. That's a local explosion. Okay. Um, H5. There was no chance for him to kind of open up things. Like, you know, you well, want to play like E5 like move. Yeah, but he then, can try, but they're not very convincing. Yeah, G2 hangs and... I mean, I mean, I don't know whether I take on G2 or not. Probably I do. Hmm. I can even take on E5. It doesn't... See, my king's not in that much danger. Right. It's you got to be... It's a bit soft. It's a bit vulnerable, but not really. It's pretty well protected. So H5... Yeah, yeah. Queen F7 is important. Stopping Knight Stopping H4. Knight H4, but he did that and you picked the pawn. Yeah, and the pawn is it's less about the pawn and more about stopping the knight. Um, and I realized now that the knight on f5 was not such a terror. Mm -hmm. uh, it was only one piece, and I could always exchange it. So I thought it was all right to allow it. 
He came in. He then this, this next phase of the game, it's the final round, and I'm playing maybe a bit carefully. He went d5 because he couldn't handle constantly thinking every move about me taking. <laughs> uh, and now it's just a matter of getting rid of his knight on f5 and then bringing home the bacon, really. I mean, it's. I, I played rook a8 just to overprotect a6. I faff around on the A file from what I remember. I don't really know what I was trying to do. I was just biding my time. There's no right. This is doing and being. You asked yes, about earlier, right? Yes. Time to be. I, I like uh, the fact that he can't do anything and you are just uh, threatening on the A file. You can yeah. exchange the F5 knight. You have pressure on the G file. It's like you, exactly. there's nothing that white can do here. So that my best games are usually like this. It's like I, I, I was good at stopping my, I was think, quite good at getting into my opponent's head, knowing what they wanted to do, and then stopping it. So, so but not just stopping it. Prophylactic thinking. Would you, I, I, mean, like... I did study, I did a lot of work on Dvoretsky when I was trying to become a better player. So I read a lot of the Dvoretsky Yusupov literature. So it was quite deep in my bones, this thinking, thinking what is the opponent up to? And prophylaxis is important to understand. <clears throat> it's not just about stopping the opponent. It's much more deeply about the relationship. It's about what do they want to do? What do I want to do? And how do I get on top of that relationship? And that was really what, what this game was about. It, do you, when you were like improving and your prophylactic thinking and so on, who whom did you study to get better? As you said, Doritz. Well, so right. So interesting. I mean, every chess player has their own story. And now with computers, it's different. Because people, you know, who teaches the young generation, I don't know, Stockfish or whatever. But um. When I was growing up, there was a, I can very closely trace when I got good. And although it didn't show in rating for a while, the foundations were laid. It was roughly when I was about 12 to 13, <clears throat> I won a competition that gave me 200 pounds of books. So I don't know what that is in rupees, but it's something like, um, let's see, 18, a pound is give or take 100 rupees. So, you know, 20,000 uh, 20, rupees, give or take worth of chess books, which back then in the in the 80s was quite a lot of material. Yeah. So books came home like My System by Nimzovich, the best games of Petrosian, Spassky, Smyslov, blah, blah, blah. And basically I studied them. Um, I came home from school at about 3.30 in the afternoon. And between 3.30 3, 3 and about 6 or f for dinner, I was in my bedroom studying world champion world championship nice. games. And that's what really made me a grandmaster. I mean, it took me years to get there, but that's what gave me the pattern recognition to understand what a good chess game looked like. Um, and I still have that. You know, it's um if I can get out of the opening, I can still show that. Brilliant. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Bishop D1 K8, yeah. Bishop F3. Yeah, this is. I'm doing a little bit of dancing here. You know, I, I'm not saying every one of these moves is perfect, but in, sooner or later, I do catch the yeah, catch the mouse. Now, now you want to take the knight, so he went back. Yeah, I want to take the knight, so he moves it, and then I think I bring the knight to f6, and very slowly. You know, there's this expression in English: "slowly, slowly, catchy monkey." It's a bit like that here. Um, in, in, he resigned here, and I think this is one of those rare yeah. positions. Yeah. Where uh, the opponent is, has equal material, I, in fact, could also be like he he could have an extra pawn as well. But uh, you took it, uh, yeah. And here he resigned because c four is falling. Yeah, he resigned because things are only going to get worse. Mm. <laughs> you know, um. Basically, if he moves his queen to protect c four, I take on a two. Yeah. Before I consider something else, if he goes king d three, I can actually play b five if I want to. Nice. Um and. Uh, He's just, it's just collapsing everywhere he looks, it's falling apart. And that's because each of my pieces is worth more than each of his pieces. Um, so it, it, Nigel Short commented on this game in the his column at the time in the Telegraph, I think it was, and he called it a minor a minor master, masterpiece, showing a complete grasp of Nimzovichian principles, which I was very touched by. And it, it, it is a Nimzovich game in some ways. It could be in a, a new version of my system. Um, that's why I was proud of it. That's why it's the one I want to share. Beautiful game. I think uh, very enjoyable. Learned a lot from it. And also that brings me to my uh, next question is, I think you have like, I'm I'm sure you're a voracious reader uh, overall. W what, what are you reading right now? Uh, and what would you recommend to people who want to read? Uh, and now also there are other mediums of gaining information like watching videos and so on right. uh, for chess and right. otherwise like just okay. outside chess okay so to start with chess um it's a tricky time because 
I am of a generation that was mostly analog, gradually becoming digital, right? So I was born in 77. Um, I was studying chess books until the sort of late 90s. It took me, I was, I began to get my first computer around maybe 96 or something, you know, like, so to put it in perspective, and then the internet didn't really kick in until, you know, at least we didn't start using it a lot until the turn of the century. And then smartphones came much later and so on. So just to give some perspective, I what worked for me is not necessarily what will work today. I do, however, wonder, um, there are all these products now, chessable training courses and um, various videos online. And all of these things are <clears throat> a kind of information where you can absorb a lot. And I think when you're young, the absorption does a lot of its work for you. The nature of your brain and how plastic it is and your own enthusiasm and your mind's capacity to make sense of things is so great that when you're younger, there is a case for absorption. And by that, I mean just taking stuff in. And therefore, that could work for videos. It can work for courses that I mentioned. However, if you're a bit older and if your challenge, if your chess formation has already kind of happened, like if you already had your first wave of chess activity and you became 2000 or 2200 or even 2400, or even Sagar, if you got GM norms and drop back down a little bit, then I think the situation is a bit different because then it's not so much about absorption. I think you, you'll gain much less from just watching stuff. I think your challenge then, as I've written about in Zebras, um, is more a kind of uh solving mentality you have to actually make your brain work harder right. and you also have to begin unlearning some of the things that are making you stuck so that means analyzing your games very carefully um something's with a real board you know something's with an actual board and not just on the computer but of course it would be technophobic or luddite to sort of say don't use the engines i'm not saying that but there is something about knowing when to use them that is important and when not to <clears throat> which is also important so in terms of material i mean um i would still recommend all of the divoretsky use of literature for more advanced players right because i think it forces you to actually grow it's a real struggle you know you, that that feeling inside of this is too difficult i can't do this that's what you have to sit with right if you want to get better you need to have the i think i've written about it in the the moves that matter but i spent a week with yusupov once Around the time I was playing quite well, I, I went on to be first equal in the World Open a few weeks later. But the time at Yusupov's house was really painful, not because he wasn't a great host and a very friendly guy, and you know I'm grateful to him, don't get me wrong. But the chess was, I realized how weak I was, mm -hmm. you know, and I was already 25, 50 odd. Wow. But I realized, oh my God, I can't cal calculate at all. I'm not seeing anything. Um, I can't stay with a thought to get to the end of it. My mind was like jumping around like crazy. And I guess I was still good enough because I was compensating in other ways with intuition and openings or whatever. Um, but I actually began to learn to calculate and it stayed with me. And it's what made the difference to being even stronger. So I would say any book that actually teaches you, not by reading, but by obliging you to give you good material, good training exercises. A lot of Jakob Agar's books are, or Ogu, I think it's how you say it. Um, are good. Um, I who else have I enjoyed reading? Um, I would still go for games collections. I think there's a lot to be said for knowing a, what a whole game looks like. Uh, I'm old fashioned that way. Like you can solve puzzles and you can do openings, but there's nothing quite replaces that sense of start to finish and the the sort of journey quality of a game. I think when that really gets into your soul. When you start playing, you, it's almost like you're, you can sense which way the story wants to go and, and it helps you make good moves. Something like this, yes? Like my great Yeah, sister, yeah, no. yeah. The Casper of Books are good, of course. Uh, and yes, I would encourage them. Um, I mean, of course, Chess for Zebras and the Seven Deadly Chesses should for be read. Sure. And the more, among the more philosophical uh, people who are interested in life outside of chess, and I hope that's all of your, your listeners, but... The moves that matter that you showed earlier. Yes. Um, there I really do try and answer what chess taught me about life. You know, it's a serious effort. 
I'm so, I'm actually very interested to get my hands on it after this interview. I'm going to find it how to get it. Maybe it's well, on I think Amazon. It's, I think it's on Am it's on there is a it's on Amazon for Bloomsbury. Um Amazon India, it's there. Right. And Bloomsbury, the publisher, has an Indian office. So I'm pretty sure it's available right. in India. Um and uh it's really people kept asking me what has chess taught you about life? And look, you can give a cliched answer like, oh, it taught me to understand the opponent and it taught me to think 10 moves ahead and concentrate. It taught me to be strategic, whatever that means. And it taught me to think tactically and uh, taught me to concentrate. These are all reasonable but somewhat superficial answers. In the book, I really take it seriously. Like, what has it taught me? And there are, I, I won't steal the thunder of the book, but I, it's the book is structured around that question and it, it's it's 64 little stories of my experiences in the chess world but each, in each case trying to draw draw down some mean some major lesson about how we live mm -hmm. um and the first first it's is is designed on the structure of the chessboard so that the first uh it's 64 sections 64 squares but there's also eight chapters of eight uh sort of vignettes i call them little stories um, so it's like eight by eight of the chessboard as well. Um, and in each of those eight chapters, I have a major overarching theme. So the first one is concentration is freedom, trying to understand the relationship between concentration and freedom. Um, there is others later, like escapism is a trap. What does that mean? Um, because it sounds paradoxical, right? And then there's actually the, the final chapter is called happiness is not the most important thing, mm. which is a weird thing to say that chess taught you. But if you look at a chess tournament, Sagar, and look at people's faces, you know, they're curled over with tension and they're struggling and they're like, oh my God, they're not happy, right? Whatever that is, it might be wonderful, but it's not happiness, right? So I, I reflect- It's addictive though. Addictive. <laughs> I, I miss it. Yeah, me too, right? It's addictive, it's compelling, it's intense, right. it's meaningful. It's a lot of wonderful things, but it's not happiness. So what does that mean? What does that mean for the rest of your life? Like. Right maybe this thing you're meant to be looking for is not happiness as such. Um, anyway, that's me. Other books. So while I've, while I've been in India, I actually read that for the first time. I watched the Netflix series, but I actually, the house I'm staying in here um, had a copy of The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, okay. um, which I actually read for the first time, you know, and her, there's nothing like the actual book in the author's own voice, beautifully written. And it, for those who don't know it, it's a, a vision of the future, a dystopia, as they call it, a, a sort of negative vision, particularly of the state of North America or America, uh, USA in particular, um, that's sort of taken over by theocratic uh, government who uh, have a weird system in which they, they're struggling with the birth rate. And so they, they do things with men and women and they, they it's, a, it's a sort of feminist critique of a very deep and sophisticated one of society because because everything that's happened in that story has happened somewhere around the world. Um, but I think it's quite important to read today because the premise of it was ecological collapse. Mm. And one of the things I do in my work with Perspectiva, my organization, is that we see three major pathways in the future, right? There's sort of one way of thinking about this is that if you look at all the converging pressures, ecological pressures in particular, weakening democracies, economic pressures of various kinds, rise of technology that's not really controlled for the public good, that's controlled mostly by private actors for their own interests, increasingly out of control, making making people's jobs redundant, um, but also creating autonomous weapons that crazy people can fire into cities uh, in the way they couldn't before. All of these things are creating serious pressures on the po make the possibility of collapse at a global scale mm. Quite likely, it's almost a default scenario for those who see it clearly enough. It is not a cause for despair or giving up. But what the risk is, is that in that context, when things begin to collapse, that the people promising order look more uh, tempting. The ones who come along and say, I'll take care of it. All this collapse, give all the power to me and I'll take care of it. I'll look after you. That's the authoritarian impulse, right? And it's very appealing to people who feel that the world doesn't make sense anymore. They don't really know what's true and false. They don't know what's good and bad. They don't know how they're going to survive. They don't know what their family's going to do. The authoritarians come along and say, we'll take care of it. We'll give you order, right? 
that's terrifying too, because we all know where that leads. It's the history of the 20th century and so on. So these two attract, they're something's called attractors, not because they're attractive, but because it's where things are leading. The third is what we have to get to, which is something more like a wise open society. To get to a wise open society, we need some deep thinking because it's not the way things are heading. The way things are heading is something more like what they sometimes call techno-feudalism, which is where the tech overlords control society right. and where we're struggling to find food and water. Um, if we really want to get to a viable world for eight plus billion people, and this is particularly true in India, by the way, because as you know, it's a hot country and it's uh, a hot country that's going to struggle with water supply and will only get worse with climate impacts. So it, it really matters that India is thinking about not just their own country and their own ecological resources, but the whole inter interdependence of the planetary system and where they fit into it. Because I think our only hope for a viable future, desirable future, is one where we um, quite radically change how we live. Mm. Um, and that means n not just business as usual, but rethinking first principles. What are we living for? What is How is our time best spent? Are we really meant to just get rich and get a bigger house? Is that what it's all about? If not, what is it about? And then what follows for our politics and who gets the power to do these things and how do you share power in the right way? And none of it's easy, don't get me wrong. I have no easy answers. But I do think unless we ask the question, we're heading for one of these default scenarios, either collapse or a kind of authoritarian control. If we want to protect open society, we need to fight for it, all of us. Um, and whatever that means for you is for you to decide, but that's how I see it. Brilliant. This was very deep. I, I have one question uh, because you, you think so deeply about these things and this has always been on my mind and this is related to chess, not uh, outside it, is you were talking about how people learn chess and get better. And this question I always had in my mind and uh, that was if everything is evolving, uh, do you think that in future people will no longer learn chess in the way that you did or I did, which was like looking at the classics and so on. And they would mm. learn chess in a completely different way. And while everyone says that we cannot emulate the play of the engines when it makes like specific moves, people would start playing like that. Yeah. Well, this is, this appears to be already happening. I mean, um, since, since playing a little bit again, I mean, I haven't played much. I played one tournament and then I've played some league games. Uh, so maybe a total of give or take 20. Um, and uh, I've already noticed, though, in the younger generation, by which I mean people, let's say, under 30, um, th there's something different about the way they look at the board. It's much more concrete. Uh, it's, it's much less about prejudice vis-a-vis -vis, that's not how we do things. So it's less about chess culture in the sense of um, this is the way you're meant to play more about does it work or not mm. um now i don't think that's a bad thing um what what do we risk losing there's something about there's something about um the classics and learning the so one thing about magnus that makes him really special i think is that although he's adapted to the digital world and, and he gets great positions out of the opening and he's much better prepared than people think he is. Even when he was apparently not that well prepared, he was still really well prepared. He just knew how to navigate the opening, right? But um, something that I felt is that he his study of the classics means that his feeling for the, the way the whole game should go was very well observed. Like he, he feels it very deeply because he knows how the world champions have played. If we lose that, I wonder how the games will look. I wonder if we'll lose some of the charm and beauty and elegance yeah, of things. Like so, the Game Changer book has all these games of top fish versus yeah, Alpha Zero. I know. And 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 they're they're interesting. And you know, I have been following some of Matthew Sadler's work on this, and you can learn a lot. And ideally it's both, right? in terms of what my previous answer, you know, the future is humans and technology in a sort of wise, yeah, yeah. careful alliance. It's not subservience to the machine, and nor is it just um, humans like rejecting technology. It's got to be some kind of wise alliance. But we've also got to be a bit careful about this because the nature of machines are so compelling 
and they make you feel that you have to attend to them all the time. Like, you know, this guy here, my smartphone is constantly demanding that I look at it, right? And um, similar with Stockfish and so on, the feeling of that impulse, let's not look at it. Let's not see what the engine says. Let's see if we can think. Um, you need to do more of that, uh, I think. And then once you've thought, then you look at the engine right. and go, oh, that's interesting. And over time, you will think a bit more like the engine, and that won't be a bad thing. But I think it would be a bad thing if you're just like a bad robot, if mm. you just become like a weak computer, you know, <laughs> then something is lost, I think. Right, right. Amazing. Uh, you know, I could go on talking to you on and on, but I know that you have many things to do. And also coming up uh, is a chance for everyone to interact with you in India. Uh, on 16th of April, you will be there at the indoor stadium in Calicut. There's a workshop yeah. of roughly around six hours, you know, three well, hours of workshop and then three yeah. hours of simul. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So it could be a long day. Uh, but it's in the inner stadium, which is quite a big building and not too hot. Yeah. And um, the the workshop, I'm still figuring out what I'll do, but it will yeah. be material from my books mostly. And um, and then uh, the symbol, of course, will last how long it lasts, depending on how good the opponents are. If, so, if, yeah. You know, if I'm not mistaken, there's no entry fee for this. There's something like a donation. No, uh, well, or a um, charity or something like that. And there's a Google form, which I'll attach yeah. the link. It. There is, um, I think the way to look at it, I think through the, the, the morning session, we do ask for an entry fee. The afternoon session, I think, is a more suggested donation form, but it's all there. I, um, I, I, I gave a suggestion there, and I'm not sure what they've decided to do. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, mostly it's just it's a pleasure to give back. I mean, a few days ago, I went to a, a chess training camp here in Calicut just because I heard it was on. And I actually showed, maybe you remember it, Simon Williams won this game in the Reykjavik Open. Yes. So miniature. And because it was on my mind, I, I walked into the class and they just put plonk, plonk me in front of this class of like 40 kids and with a demo board. And I was, after saying hello, I said, okay, I'll show you this game. And it was fun. It was really, really fun. But it, it uh, that's kind of how chess works for me now. It's sort of every so often I'm, asked to go somewhere and do something and I do it for fun. Um, I must admit though, I'm I, I'm beginning to be keen to have an opening repertoire with black again. Nice. Because nice. because it's a it's a problem, right? If you if you haven't played for a while, you really feel it as black. If you're trying to hold a, le a grandmaster level yes. without black openings, it's quite tough. Um so I'm I'm that's the only thing I really have time to work on. Uh let's see if it, if it helps. But in the meantime I'm just doing what follows and this this thing in calicut came about because when covid struck mm. um there was a need to create an online community for the local players and it grew and it, it there's now online events quite often uh, through this vehicle and when i heard about it because i was here he said well why don't we do some kind of event in calicut uh -huh. and it's just i feel a certain affinity for this place um because my wife grew up here and I've been here a few times now. So I'm I'm not exactly a Malayali, as you can see, but um, I do feel a certain obligation to give back to the area. So you, you, you can speak the language, yes? Unfortunately not. I can speak a little. So my wife's family is Telugu, so I can speak some pidgin Telugu. I understand what's happening at home. I know how to get fed. You know, <laughs> I kind of, can, I know. Can you uh, say, a, say a line or two? Because that would, I don't um, uh, know Telugu. So, so for example, sometimes uh, after I've finished food, um, one of the, or or people will offer me more food. This is the Indian way, right? Yeah. And they'll, you've eaten plenty and they'll be quick to try and serve you more. And I've learned to say, um, uh, so sometimes in English, I'll say, I'll say some, something like, Oddu, which is like no. Um Chala ish Chala ishtam, I really like it. Aite, but um Kadapu Nindindin. So my stomach has been filled. Nice. So it's something like that. Um and we look, you know, I so like I say, living with the family, I've picked up base so I can so often tell what they're talking about. Mm. Um, but I'd struggle to follow a Telugu movie or anything like that. And Malayalam, I hope to learn more of later, just because uh, I think we'll be coming here. A bit more often, and uh, also it's it's a weird thing. The Malayalam language, uh, it's the curviest language I've ever seen. It, it's just like one curve after the other, right? <laughs> it's like being on a roller coaster ride the whole way. 
yeah, yeah. I, I am unable to understand anything in spite of being in Kerala several times. Also, right. Tamil, uh, being in right. Chennai so many times, I have no idea what they are talking about. Right. So, we I, watched, I, just briefly, we watched Chennai Express again a few yeah. nights ago. It's a film with Shah Rukh Khan. It's a kind of classic Bollywood film. But it's very interesting to watch that. For those who don't know India, and anyone who's watching this outside of India, you know, the North-South divide is quite distinct. Mm. Um, and uh, although it's one country, you do notice a big cultural shift, and they play on that with lots of comedy features. Like they have the lungi dance at the end, for example, um, and the uh, the presumption that people in the south may not speak Hindi, for example. Uh, all of that's going on. Uh, it's a fascinating country. Very happy to be here. Yeah, we are glad that you have come to India. Maybe someday you will also travel to other parts of the country. Yeah. Uh, yeah. While ending this interview, I have one final question for you. Maybe a little heavy, you can uh, choose to answer it or not. Uh, so, as you say, you are driven a lot by your purpose. What would you say is your purpose right now in life? To do my part, such as it is, in helping save civilization from itself. Um, it's really that sort of on the one hand, it's ridiculous because what can one person do? On the other hand, my reading of the position as a chess player, the position of the world, is that while there's a lot to be happy about and some things are going well, the general trends are not good. Mm. The general trends I see as being threatening to the only life we know and love uh, a species that's evolved to have consciousness, language, love, and so on, but actually on a planet in the vast reaches of space where we've evolved these capacities, and it's very, very precious, and we risk being foolish enough to screw it up. So although it's not happening tomorrow or the next day, it's already underway, this process of incipient collapse. And I can't do much about it personally, but at the same time, I can't turn away and, and I hope there'll be many other millions of people who feel that way, that actually we have a degree of duty to attend to what's going on, to really try and understand it and then to find our place in it. Really? And that's what I'm, what I'm up to. Yeah. The way in which you have synthesized chess, uh, spirituality, life overall, it's a pleasure to, to uh, see well, that uh, happening. Well, thank you. Well, can I also say it's been lovely to watch Chess Space India boom uh, over the last few years. I mean, I, I check in with it every so often. Your own enthusiasm is a big part of that, of course. But I also know that it's been great to see Indian chess go from strength to strength. Um, so many grandmasters now, so many very strong grandmasters. Um, and um, good to have that channel. And it's yeah. good to, I hope it goes from, keeps going from strength to strength. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for your time. Pleasure. Good to see you.